Well, welcome to this site of Qumran, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. What was discovered here is the most monumental archeological discovery of all time. Now, my wife and I, we hiked up to Cave One. It was quite a journey. The first time we did it was a fail because we had a hard time. We had photos and everything, but we couldn't really locate it because the mountainside looks all the same. But that night we came home and we just reanalyzed everything and we found some locations of some rocks that we said, okay, that's rock that's here pointing up there. We went up that draw and were able to find it. So it was absolutely unbelievable. In fact, the highlight of this video is going to be taking you along with us on this journey as we discover and enter this incredible cave where all the discoveries began. We'll also see some of the other caves as well where these Dead Sea Scrolls were found. We are gonna be walking through this. We're gonna be sharing some about the location, the historical background here. And of course, then we're gonna explore this site here. We're gonna go down and look at these caves. We're gonna be showing you this community and then we're gonna end with the faith lesson. So I think you're gonna find this very, very touching, this place here. Once again, monumental discovery here. Absolutely mind-blowing what we're gonna see and experience here. So you ready to explore this? So let's learn about these scrolls, where they're located, and the people who wrote them. Again, the discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls are the most important discoveries about the Bible to date. It just doesn't get any bigger. The scrolls were discovered in 11 caves between the years of 1947 and 1956, although they still are searching even to this day for more. The manuscripts are numbered according to the caves in which they were found. There are around 972 manuscripts with 15,000 fragments that have been found to date. The longest is 26 feet or 8 meters long. Qumran is located in the northwest side of the Dead Sea on Highway 90, about 13 miles or 21 kilometers east of Jerusalem. It's in the Judean wilderness, which is barren and hot. It's located about 1,200 feet or 366 meters below sea level. Its water source comes from the Judean mountains to the west of the community via an aqueduct. The community here at Qumran were made up of the Essenes. They are the ones who copied and hid the scrolls in all these caves in the area. They lived here from around 200 BC to 68 AD. They were very, very religious people, very, very religious Jews. They saw that the priesthood was corrupt. We know it was corrupt because Jesus was condemned to death by a corrupt system. Okay, so they saw this and they lost hope in the the religious leaders in the spiritual center, so to speak, in Jerusalem. So they left Jerusalem and they came down here into the desert because they wanted to seek the Lord. They wanted to get away from it all to seek the Lord. And so they devoted themselves to seeking the Lord. They were very educated people and they became a community, kind of like a commune. And so then they would study together and they would copy the manuscripts. They would copy them. We'll see some of the rooms in which they would do that. Now the Essenes also existed in large numbers outside of this Qumran community. Thousands lived throughout Judea. They were fewer in number than the Pharisees and Sadducees, the other two major groups at the time. They were the most conservative of the main groups of Judaism. They were dedicated to communal life and to voluntary poverty, daily immersion in ritual baths called mikvahs, and abstaining from many of the pleasures of life. Their priestly class practiced celibacy. It was this group of Jews who lived here at Qumran. 
They mainly lived in the surrounding caves or tents just outside the community and then would gather here for communal eating, study, meetings, copying of the manuscripts, fellowship, and so forth. When the Jews rose up in rebellion in 66 AD and began taking their country back again from the Romans, the Romans sent in legions of soldiers to stomp out this rebellion. When the Essenes who lived here saw this, they hid the scrolls in the caves in this area to preserve them. Some believe they stored them in the caves anyway, as it was a safe place to preserve them from the elements and possible invasions of their community. Regardless of the reason, these scrolls were hidden away in the caves around this area to be supernaturally preserved by God for over 2,000 years until they were discovered in 1947. Shortly, we'll be hiking up to the first cave discovered and showing it to you. Do you see that draw going up there? About halfway up that on the right is cave number one. That's where the complete Isaiah scroll was found that is virtually identical to what we have today. Wow, that's incredible. But here is where the Essenes lived who God used to preserve scripture and to confirm that he is able to preserve his word. He is the word and he's going to preserve his word. They believe that the Messiah was coming but oftentimes as many in that period did they didn't see the period between Christ first coming to be crucified and his coming back in power and great glory so they saw both of those so that in their mind this Messiah was going to come back and establish the kingdom renew Israel and so they were getting ready for this Messiah to come some have wondered was John the Baptist part of this group we don't know. We don't know. They certainly shared similarities. So right here are where probably 80% of the scrolls were found. And then we have caves 1, 2, 3, and 11 that would start, that would be in the area where cave number 1 is, down in that area there. Now what's interesting that most people don't know is that caves 4 through 10 were man-made. Caves 1 through 3 and 11 are up on the hillsides in natural caves. But the lower caves here were made by hand as the terrain was soft and easily carved out. These caves were nearby to the community for safe storage and access of the scrolls. That's why 75% of the scrolls were found in these lower caves. That's also why many of the scrolls found in these lower caves were fragmented. It's likely tomb raiders and treasure seekers pillaged them looking for treasure as they could see the holes in these lower caves here and knew there was something in them. The scrolls in the upper caves were much more preserved because no one found them, most likely, until 1947. These lower man-made caves were originally made with small openings, but over time have been opened up due to treasure seekers and recent archaeologists. To date, around 53 caves have been excavated and the search continues in this Qumran area. This area has produced a gold mine of manuscripts, all of which verify the truthfulness and accuracy of the Bible we have today. Here are just a few caves to show you. Now let's take a hike up to Cave 1, where all the discoveries began. This was quite an adventure, and the first attempt to find the cave was a fail, as the cave is unmarked and all we had to go by were photos and videos we had seen of others in their attempt to find the cave. As you can see, 
the landscape all looks quite the same. That night, we reanalyzed everything, and then the next day, we're able to locate the cave. Here you can see the cave in relation to the other caves and the landscape. It's quite a steep hike up to the cave as it has loose rocks and shale to navigate. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Here we are hiking up this thing. We're hiking up this thing. <laughs> Pretty brutal. There it is in the shade. However, we found it with ease and were deeply touched that we had the privilege to be in the very place of this monumental discovery of the ages. Well, here we are at cave one of these Qumran scroll caves. This is the most significant cave here. Right here is where it all began. A young man, Bedouin, was looking for a goat, his sheep, and he was walking the hillside here. It's really rough, but these goats get up here and they eat this brush up here. The opening right above this lower part was the original opening, and that's where the young man threw his rock, and then it came down and he heard it hit some stuff, so he went in, climbed up through there, came down. Later, when it became evident that these were just incredible findings, an archeologist came up, and then they opened up this lower part so that they could access everything. But it's quite large, the cave, as you can see. Really amazing to be here because these scrolls that were found here date back to around two, three hundred years before Christ. They absolutely prove the Bible as true. They prove all of the prophecies concerning Christ were written before Christ because some say that the prophecies that Christ supposedly fulfilled according to them were just written after the time of Christ. These findings in these caves now prove that the Bible was written, that the Old Testament, all of these prophecies happened two to three hundred years before the time of Christ. So there's no way that it, we could rewrite history. So this is an incredible finding and Christ fulfilled all of these prophecies. It proves that Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. Well, this is what we've been waiting for. Let's now go inside the cave and show it to you. Again, you can see that the lower part of the cave opening is large now, but this was opened up by archeologists to have better access to the cave. You can see why this cave was never entered for around 2000 years. It's a brutal climb up here and the original cave opening was very small. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. Just think of the significance of this cave and the discoveries made here. They absolutely changed the view of the Bible and now gives it undeniable credibility. This is amazing. We are just in awe of being here as we've waited so long to see this. We're also super excited and blessed to be able to show you it as well. Wow, this is really, really special. Well, here we are now inside the cave and the cave kind of goes back around a little bit and then dead ends. See it right in here, kind of just goes around. So right in here is where these Dead Sea Scrolls would have been found in these clay jars preserved by God to be revealed at His exact perfect 
timing. Incredible, isn't it? According to archaeological, biblical evidence, this is the most monumental discovery in the history of archaeology. Right here is where it began. So it's a real pleasure to, to be here and to show you this. Thank you, Lord, for preserving these scrolls in your perfect sovereign plan. You know exactly when you wanted to reveal this finding. You kept them preserved for almost 2,000 years. And at the right time, you revealed them. Wow. Well, now we're going to come to the Bible time teaching here at Qumran Scroll. And what we're going to focus on here, we've talked about some of the history here about these Essenes. We've talked about the discovery that was made. And we've talked about how these scrolls were written before Jesus was here. So the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, we know were written before Jesus fulfilled them. So they weren't written afterward. So the critics now have lost their ammunition. All right, and that the scrolls that we found then validate the oldest manuscripts that we did have of the Old Testament. So what we have here is a, the Word of God that has been preserved. Now God loves His Word, and He is going to keep His Word intact. Okay, yes, there might be some slight variations and stuff from different manuscripts, but when you put all the manuscripts together, what you have is a writing that we can believe in. We're going to be talking about some of these things here. So the Dead Sea Scrolls would have been the same Hebrew Bible that Christ and the Apostles used. Okay, so when Christ arrives and the Apostles, we did not have a New Testament. It would be written over time, over about roughly from about 40 A.D. to about 90, 95 A.D. John, the Apostle John would write the book of Revelation roughly in around 90, 95 A.D. So we have about a 50 year period wherein the New Testament is written. The Old Testament was written over a longer period of time. Who was the beginning author of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible? How did it begin? Okay, who before Moses? God. Ten Commandments. Who wrote those commandments? The finger of God. He's the one who started it all. God is a revealing God. He wants to reveal himself to us. So the Hebrew Bible that they discovered here would be the same Bible that Jesus and the apostles used. The Hebrew Bible was divided up into three sections. Okay, it had the Torah, it had what was called the writings, which were the historical books, Proverbs, Psalms, Job, things like that. And then you had the prophets, major and minor prophets. So you had three divisions of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Now Christ gave full validity and authority to the Hebrew Bible that existed during his time, which was the same Hebrew Bible that was discovered here. He said over and over, so that it might be fulfilled. It is written, have you not read? Christ used this same Hebrew Bible repeatedly, and it says not one jot or not one tittle will be removed, and that his word is eternal. So he continually is giving validation. It says in Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, being Christ, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So the same Hebrew Bible Jesus used on, with the men that were on the Emmaus Road, and he expounded the whole from the Old Testament 
prophecies concerning himself. Now, the New Testament is built upon the Old Testament. We have around 850 quotes from the Old Testament that are found in the New Testament. 850. So, you really aren't going to understand the New Testament unless you really understand the Old Testament. And one of the weaknesses in the church today is there's a great focus on the New Testament, but not as much focus on the Old Testament. But all of the concepts and foundation of the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. So, the Bible was written by 40 different authors on three different continents and written over a period of around 1600 years. Yet all the books harmonize and carry the same message. They perfectly harmonize and come together. And this harmony is a miracle in and of itself. So for example, if there was an accident on a street corner and people had different angles at it, you would get many different versions of that accident. But with the Bible, you have 1600 years of history, you have 40 different authors, and you have three different continents, and yet they all carry the same message. Why? Because Scripture is God-breathed. So it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God. How much? All. So God is the author. He breathed it out and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God or the person of God may be competent, perfect, equipped for every good work. So all scripture is inspired. And in 2 Peter 1.19 it says, And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation or heart. It's not derived from anyone. Prophecy, God's word comes from him. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. What we have was no invention of mankind. So when you get religions where it does come from man, then be careful. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God inspired these people and they wrote his word. It says in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, for the word of God is living and active. It's living, it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You'll hear people say sometimes that I want to find myself. The way you find yourself is by knowing what God's Word says about you. If you want to know who you are, then read God's Word. He'll tell you all about who you are because His Word is the one who discerns and lets us know all about our thoughts, our attentions, and everything about us. Now, once again, Christ is continually validating His Word. The Hebrew Bible, which was the same Bible discovered here that Jesus used, He said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He says, For truly I say to you, Matthew 5, Until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. It says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what we have is the confidence that God's Word is inspired and that what was discovered here gives authenticity, credibility to what we have today. Because there's just virtually no difference between what was discovered here and what we have today. So you can have full confidence that you have God's Word. Now yes, obviously there are over time there has been some slight 
variation in copying, but when you bring it all together and you analyze it all together, then you find that it's all weaves together and it's all very accurate. So you can have full confidence. So what are some faith lessons that we can take away from this place here at Qumran, these Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, they were one of the most important discoveries in the history of mankind. And God supernaturally did this in order to prove the reliability of His Word. So do we believe the Bible? Do we have full confidence in it? So what God did here is He picked the perfect place and the perfect time, and He's the one who supernaturally preserved His Word here. He preserved it here, but He also preserved it through the writings throughout history so that when these were discovered, they matched up perfectly with what we had. So it shows that he's able to preserve his word. Now Christ referred to every section of the Hebrew Bible, which was the Old Testament, and repeatedly said, so that it might be fulfilled. It is written, have you not read, and so forth. If Christ claimed that this Hebrew Bible that was discovered here was true and accurate, then we can trust it as well. Christ quoted from it, he used it, and he used even tiny fractions of it. So we can have all the confidence. So what about us? Do we have the confidence that God's word is true? It's living, it's active. And so one of the things that's really special about God's word, over the years I've grown to understand this, is just let God's word speak. Because when you read God's Word, God is in that person speaking because His Word is living, right? And is active. So when you speak God's Word, you can have the confidence that God is in that person bringing His Word to life. That's why it's so important in our preaching. It's so important in whatever we're, whether we're Bible study leaders or Sunday school, you want to use God's Word. And sometimes what we do, I, I like to stay in God's Word as much as I can. You know, use some illustrations on occasion, but you know, there are many, many illustrations in the Bible. Okay, so we can find great illustrations in the Bible, and then we can just stay right in the Bible, and now we're spending more time in this living, active Word of God. So yes, God's Word is living, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And when we look at the Old Testament, there's basically three components to the Old Testament. We have the moral laws from the Old Testament. We have the civil laws, which are like government. And then we have the laws that deal with the sacrificial system, okay? Now, Christ fulfilled the sacrificial system. That part of the Old Testament no longer applies to us. We don't need to offer animals. Christ is our sacrifice. The civil laws, the laws of governing, we can gain great insight into those. But the moral laws are retained. In fact, we find in, in Romans and we find in Corinthians that it says these things were written beforehand for us today. Okay, so they're examples for us today. So the moral laws of the Old Testament apply to us today. Once again, the sacrificial system, we set aside. Christ fulfilled that. And of course the governmental, then we find great wisdom in that, but they don't necessarily apply to us today as well. Now, Christ in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word became what? Flesh. And it dwelt among us. Okay, so Christ is the living Word. So Christ is passionate about His Word. He is passionate about it. So we should be passionate as well. And he was passionate in defending the same Hebrew Bible discovered here that he had and used that was discovered and now is the same as we have today. So I guess that's the big idea. And the other big idea is that prophecy gives credibility to God's word. There is no other religion no other writing that really steps into prophecy. And when they do, it's very general. You can't make out really what it is. The Bible is very, very specific. Jesus would be born where? 
Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. He would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah, that he would be pierced, not a bone would be broken. He fulfills these specific prophecies. So prophecy is one of your greatest tools in defending the Bible because no other religion can touch it because only God knows the future. So prophecy is very, very important. So God has supernaturally preserved his word and once again, what we discovered here, we know was written before the time of Christ. So now there's full confidence that all of the prophecies about him were written beforehand and he fulfilled them all. Great place to be here, great things happened right here and they just show us that this, these discoveries were monumental. They didn't really change anything about the Bible because it was all the same, but it really gives confidence and it really blows away the critics. It really removes their ammunition now. It removes their ammunition. So, well, thank you and may God richly bless you.